when I talk about unconscious bias, my question here is, does it really matter? And my first slide, woof, that doesn't work. My first slide is about this idea that this may challenge you. And uh, uncomfortable truths is a buzzword that pops up from time to time. And on the right here, you've got Ruby Bridges, who was six in 1960 when she went to a previously white school. There was a black baby doll in a coffin. And she was, you know, they threatened to poison her. She's six years old. And she was only allowed to bring food that she brought from home for her safety. And, and this is the challenging thing because this, is not, this person is still around. She gives talks from what I can remember. And, you know, this is a really, this is, change is not something that just happens very lightly with very minimal effort and people just go, oh, you know what? It's okay. This is, this is the, this is what happens when you have to, when you bring about change. So I want to ask people to think about, not write anything down, but to think about the bias that she received. Was it conscious or unconscious bias? And I want people to think about that for a few seconds. And then I'm going to give my take. So you got a six-year-old, people are threatening to kill her. Do you think that's conscious or unconscious bias? So my take on this is, do you think it mattered to Ruby? Do you think that if someone threatened you when you were six years old, whether it was conscious or unconscious, do you think it would matter? And that's the sort of question that I want to ask across a few different other examples as well. So Tamir Rice was 12 years old when he was killed by a policeman holding a replica gun. Uh, he didn't make any verbal threats or point the gun towards the officers. He was shot and killed very, very quickly by the time the police had pulled up. It was a, a very short amount of time before he was killed. Do you think it mattered to Tamir if he was killed because he was, because the police were consciously or unconsciously biased? Do you think it mattered to his family? In 2015, uh, just doing a search on racism in Belgium, I just picked a country. Uh, there was a situation where this person was uh, lost a leg after being chased by a police car. And on Facebook, uh, you had statements about the kind there. And there's more, there's more where that came from. Did it matter? Did his left leg feel... Did he lose his left leg and was it worse because it was conscious or unconscious bias? Uh, you know, when you start to think about that, it all of a sudden this idea of conscious bias doesn't matter. It doesn't seem as important anymore to me as a personal opinion. You might have a different opinion on that. Um, but it, I've shown you some really obvious things, but what it is, it's more subtle. So, uh, this was really, this happened just recently where Vanessa Nakate um, got cropped out from, uh, from a photo. And uh, it was just bizarre when I first saw it. I just, it was just bizarre. I can't, I can't explain it, but it can be more subtle. And again, whether you're, when you're the recipient of this uh, subtle bias, it can hurt just as badly whether it's conscious or unconscious, it doesn't really. Uh, when you're the victim, it, it doesn't really matter from what I can tell. But bias also includes people who do similar things getting treated differently. So who gets forgiven and who gets punished? So one of the things that I like to, to teach people is to actually start to break down and say, well, can you think of another example where someone's been given a very different uh, situation where you know they're forgiven or punished? So this is Brock Turner, who was uh, on the left, who's um, very famously uh, was uh, treated quite nicely because I think the judge recognized that he could have been an Olympic swimmer one day, 
and they thought that it might ruin his career if he was, you know, uh, you know, uh, treated like a person or treated like a, you know, as someone who has to bear the ac the consequences of his actions. And then you've got uh, uh, Dayon Davis here who gets five years in prison for, for, sh for a shoe, for a shoe robbery. And I think it just really shows this idea. I, I call it uh, side by side. When you actually start to put these examples side by side, it becomes really easy to see who gets forgiven and who gets punished. Um, this is actually fairly close to home. So in Australia, in, in Victoria, in Melbourne, where I live, uh, there was a lot of um, COVID happening in the uh, rich and affluent areas. And people were just breaking things. And this guy uh, was uh, walking around and you know, no people were wearing masks, cafes were full. But in the place where there wasn't that much COVID, there were cops that were surrounding towers. And they found out later on that the, uh, the ombudsman for, I think it was a human rights ombudsman, actually was saying that um, that lockdown, having those police around the towers was actually a breach of human rights. And again, the, the housing minister for Victoria just said, we're not going to apologize for that. And again, it's like who gets forgiven and who gets punished. And uh, once you start to, to understand that and you can do what I would call a simple discourse analysis about who gets forgiven, who gets punished, it becomes really, really obvious where those biases lie. And these biases are obstacles for people from marginalized groups. And I really love this uh, picture because it actually says, well, actually, I'm just gonna judge you on who gets to the finish line. And they don't actually judge the degree of difficulty uh, and I'd also like to point out that when I talk about intersectionality, um, I'm talking about uh, having more, belonging to more than one marginalized group. And so I like to think, or well, don't like to think of it, but I think of it as a, uh, a power function. So if you're from, uh, you know, uh, it's exponential, it's exponentially more difficult to be a person from two marginalized groups than to be a person from one marginalized group. And incidentally, uh, actually, I might leave that one up for a little bit later, um, that story. So for me, when you talk about unconscious bias, I'm thinking, well, actually, I think we should center the people who are marginalized. So when you're talking about unconscious bias, you're centering the, the perpetrator, you're centering yourself. And I don't think that's actually really helpful. And this one they were saying is like, you know, is it just an easy get out clause for, for behavior that's bad and I, I don't really want to be able to sort of focus on that. So I think what we should be doing is listening to the people who are the most marginalized in our society because they are the canaries in the coal mine um, and how comfortable they are, how, how well treated they are is an indication for how healthy that society is. So in Australia at the moment, uh, we are not a healthy society. We are not a healthy society. Um, and it's been like that for a while now. Because when you look at the most marginalized people in our society, they're treated really badly. And the way I like to think of how we adjust this is think of a triage in a hospital's emergency department. There's a lot of words here, you don't really need to think about it, but the more marginalized a person, the more we should help them. Because the people who aren't marginalized or aren't marginalized very much might not need as much help. So when you think about intersectionality uh, and you're saying, well, if you've got more than one marginalized part of one marginalized group, it's almost like having a heart attack. You want to be seen soon and you want to be given as much help as possible. If you just sort of hurt your finger a little bit, you shouldn't be the one at the, the front of the queue. And in the following two slides, I've got a couple of graphs where I talk about um, who are actually listening to based on their degree of difficulty. So this is what I call the intersectionality spectrum. And this degree of difficulty is something that I've sort of calculated. So I'm a big fan of George P. Box's quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And the reason I show this is because I know it's wrong, but hopefully it'll be useful. And what we do in Australia is we listen to people over on this side of the one, so white males, white females, they, they're 
overrepresented in a lot of media, in leadership positions, et cetera, et cetera. We don't listen to people over on this side um, because actually overall, like I said, we're, we're, we, are a sick society. we are a sick society. We're not a healthy society. And if you think about it from a triage point of view, and this degree of difficulty is actually calculated in a certain way. Um, you can sort of see it in the spreadsheet, but well, the way I see that we should do it, if we were to do it in a triage point of view, where this big arrow here is like where we listen to the most, that should be actually on the other side. We should be centering the people over on this side. And just to highlight here as well, I'm sitting here. So I'm actually extremely privileged when you look at, when you look to the people to my right. My, my family, my immediate family is all to the right of me. I'm the most privileged person in my family. And the way I think of things is how do I help people to the right of me? Because I don't necessarily need to help people to the left as much as I need to help people to the right. And how do I center, center these voices? But it's not just important to listen. We have to show courage and act. So I don't, there's, there's a couple of things in here that I just want to show is um, what matters to people in one or more marginalized groups is how you're supported. And I think we mentioned a little bit more about that inclusion. It's like, you know, you feel supported, but you have to recognize that if you're, if you're neutral, you're on the side of the oppressor, right? If you're neutral, the system is not going to change. It's going to say, it's going to keep its momentum, but to act, <clears throat> to be, to fight the system, it actually takes courage and a willingness to sacrifice your privilege to help others. So, uh, really interesting. The only person who agreed to teach Ruby, the six-year-old, was a white woman called Barbara Henry. Now, could you imagine what Barbara would have had to go through to actually do that? For a whole year, she was the only one who taught uh, taught Ruby. You can imagine going into the <laughs> into the staff room there, and I don't think you, she would have felt very included. And then, but the thing is it's an act of courage to be able to actually fight the system. And that's, that's not easy. There are many times where I have decided that I am not going to fight because I do not have the, uh, I just don't have it in me. So I was trying to find a quiet, I couldn't find one, so I stuck my own in, apologies for that. Um, right, you can read it. You know, for me, inclusion is being comfortable to be able to say these things without losing my job, losing friends, or damaging my career. And I won't talk about this with my friends. I won't. So here's some, I always like to end on, I think this is near the end, is on practical things that you can do. You can change your social media to censor intersexually marginalized people. You can get out of your way to encourage people from marginalized groups uh, and identify talented people from marginalized groups who may not have had the opportunity. And the, these are ways that you can use to, your privilege to step aside to be able to allow people to have the opportunities that they've missed. And if you're up for it, looking at change, to change the systems in your organizations. And this is a really great example. And it's surprising how many times I've seen this in the music industry, where you have uh, someone who's got a lot of privilege who's saying, hey, if you give this person a chance, I will, I will make it worth your while. And that person became, uh, you know, be able to, you know, I never had to play a small jazz club again for Ella Fitzgerald. And that was a sign of someone sacrificing their privilege or using their privilege to provide an opportunity for someone else. There was another situation, I think Fred Astaire did it, um, Prince did it, or well, the artist not formerly known as Prince did it as well. But uh, really, really interesting to be able to see those, those, those things happening. So in summary, for me, unconscious bias, yes, no, not really interested. For me, it's about centering marginalized voices and trying to support people from marginalized groups to your right in the intersectionality spectrum. Everything else is sort of not going to be as helpful for the people who are, who are marginalized. And if you want to know more, um, I recently tried to pull together a, uh, a workshop 
um, a theoretical one uh, called Improving Diversity Inclusion and Senior Leadership, which has got some of these themes in there. And there's some other interesting things that are out there. In terms of centering uh, social media, if you're on Twitter, I put down this list, a public, it should be a public list of people to follow. And these are the people that are sort of high frequency tweeters, probably going to take you out of your comfort zone if it's not already, who uh, I, I use as my gauge and have really sort of, um, I've, I've followed, when I've started following, um, when I've started following marginalized voices, I learned way more than I've learned anywhere else. But there's a price to be paid. When I was talking about this to someone the other day, she said, yeah, I've noticed that I've learned a lot more, but I'm way more sadder than I was before. Because a lot of these stories of marginalized people are, um, yeah, they're not, they're not happy stories. Um, but you have to go through that process to be able to come out the other end and say, well, actually, it gives me motivation to keep uh, doing these sort of things um, to bring about change. So I think that is it. So I don't know what happens now.